It's the morning after the night before, and I'd like to take a look at the game between Nodibek Abdusatorov and Anish Giri from round seven of the Tatar Steel Masters. And this was a masterly game. We'll see what happened in a second. So we've got Abdusatorov, 19 years old. He's not just promising, he has already delivered in so many tournaments. World Rapid Play Champion in 2021. He almost won the Tata Steel Masters last year. And of course, he was a gold medal winner for Uzbekistan in the Chennai Olympia 2022. Really impressive. He's facing Anish Giri, leading in the Tata Steel Masters. 19-year-old against a 29-year-old. There's a 10-year age gap. And we have a Petrov on the board. Slight surprise from Giri, but he's played this before. And I think the thing about the Petrov is that often you get quite forced lines in some variations. And I think that suits Giri. You know, he's incredibly well prepared. And so this is an interesting moment. Very quickly, instead of, you know, one of the main lines with D4, Abdus Satorov decides to play c4. Now that's a little bit unusual. Obviously it's discouraging black from playing d5. Bishop e7 from Giri. He thought for about a minute and a half, so you know he's maybe on slightly unfamiliar territory. Not that this is very unorthodox. And now knight c3. And this was taken again after a five minute thought from Giri. So he's you know feeling a little bit unsure. And I think this is a quite a clever choice from Abdus Satorov. It's been seen before. Um, if black plays absolutely correctly, then it's not a very dangerous system. But you've got to get it exactly right. And we can compare this position with this one, knight c3, which there's been a lot of attention um, on this variation over the past few years. Obviously very, very similar pawn structure, except we have this pawn on c4 in in our Abdus Tor of Giri game. So what's the big difference? Well, there's a little difference. You can see that this square is available for the queen. Sometimes that can be very useful if, you, if you're going to sort of form battery down here. But also the pawn on c4 just gives white a little bit more control over that d5 square, preventing black expanding in the middle. Giri thought for a couple of minutes and castled. This is a cannier way of playing. Because the king actually is safe in the middle for the moment, then why not just remain flexible? So for example, after this, you know, it could be that black can actually castle queenside. You know, if it looks like white is, you know, developing an attack on the king side. So I think that's a cannier way to play. But castles isn't bad. Bishop d3. That's pointing in the right direction. Knight dc, uh, knight d7, excuse me, bishop e3. So it's clear that in not castling quickly, uh, Abdesatorov has perhaps the idea the castle on the queen sides knight f6 played seems reasonable to protect the king side h3 okay stopping a knight or perhaps a bishop going to g4 b6 so giri was still consuming quite a lot of time over his moves thought for Almost seven minutes over this one. Thought for almost 10 minutes over knight f6. Queen c2 played. Yeah, there we go. Just tucking the queen behind the bishop. So there's just a little bit of pressure here. Bishop b7. Okay, it looks like a nice diagonal and certainly discourages white from playing g4, g5. Obviously, the knight can be taken. Castle's queen side. Right. So already we've got an interesting position on the board because we've got kings on opposite wings, which makes it just a bit more double-edged. 
Um, not just in the middle game. In an end game, it could be an advantage to have the king on the other side of the board. Well, let's see. H6, okay, looks reasonable to, to uh, get and take any pressure off this one, off h7. And rook e1. Well, I mean, I think it's quite clear, just optically, we can see that this position is just easier for white to play than black. You know, white's pieces are better developed. The rook has come to the open file, where it looks at that bishop. You can see that white's bishops have more scope well, certainly than this one. The bishop on b7 is excellent. But the bishop on e7 is a little bit boxed in. So white just has an easier time in this position. But there's nothing concrete as yet. You can't point to an advantage. Rook e8 looks very sensible. Bishop d4. Right, so white is building quite nicely. Um... I mean, the obvious way to relieve pressure in this position for black is to play bishop f8 to offer an exchange of rooks. And this could be played. Now, queen takes would allow the pawns to be doubled. So knight takes, let's say check, nice to push the king in the corner. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that white just is a bit better here. White's pieces are really nicely placed. Um, pieces on the back rank. So it's not easy for black already. And I think that's why Geary was tempted to play quite a forcing move to sort of clarify the situation. If the bishop goes back, it's clear that white has achieved nothing. So white really has to take. So that certainly clears black's position. But there's an obvious drawback to playing with c5 is that deep pawn here, deep pawn on d6, is backward. It can't be protected by another pawn. We want to, we ideally would like to cheat and put the pawn back on c7 to protect the pawn on d6. Now this is a nice moment. It's important for white to exchange off that bishop on b7. It's going to make it easier to occupy these these light squares in the middle so we need to exchange bishops and a little finesse so first of all just check the king into the corner it means that if an endgame arises the king black's king is going to be further away from the middle that's where the king needs to be king f8 somehow feels a bit dubious because after an exchange when the bishop comes back then that queen might at some point have the chance to get in on h7. So the king really needs to go into the corner. But as I said, it's further away from the middle. And now the bishop bounces back. So a clever little finesse, but that one tempo might make all the difference later. Exchange of bishops, so exactly what white wants to achieve, but black can't avoid that. And it means we can occupy d5. And... Nice move from Abdusatorov, knight d2. I think the only thing that would concern me about white's position is the chance for black to counterattack on the queen side and somehow make use of that bishop. The moment that bishop is blocked by the pawn on c3, but if black could play a6, b5, possibly b4, or just get some play on the b file, then... You know, who cares about this pawn? So a6 looks very logical from Geary. King b1, okay, steps away from any potential pins. Bishop g5 came anyway. So what about b5? Is this serious? Now, Geary didn't play this. In fact, after queen d3, okay, let's say queen b7, on the b file, rook e1. It's not clear what black can do here, actually. I mean, for a start, well, you have to sort out this rook. I mean, if this is exchanged, perhaps just queen takes, and the end game is very pleasant. Um, so, in fact, you know, this counterplay with b5 doesn't really achieve that much, not at the moment, anyway. Bishop g5 played Geary would very much like to exchange off bishop for knight. 
So therefore, knight f3 pushes the bishop back, queen d3. So Abdusatorov is taking control. There's a bit of activity here. b5, Giri needs to break out. But in fact, it, it, it's never easy to judge the correct moment to do this. In fact, the computer frowns on this one and thinks that black should actually wait and play like this and go rook b8. And after queen d5, in fact, queen a4 gives a little bit of counterplay because b3 would bring that bishop into the game and well you want to keep the rook away from this after rook e1 now b5 and um, black is actually generating some counterplay on the queen side but you know these moves they're very hard to judge whether that's going to be sufficient and you know b5 straight away feels like the right way to go Exchange on e8. Yeah, incidentally, um, after queen takes d6, queen f5 is annoying, to put it mildly. So rook takes rook, queen takes, and not queen takes, rook d8. It's a nice skewer. So knight d2. So this one is just spinning round to e4 and if this is taken then that knight stands on an absolutely beautiful square on c4 protecting everything hitting d6 so queen e6 knight e4 now it is starting to get very serious for black can you imagine this end game black's pawns don't look very healthy there so the bishop came back to e7. Now that is a sure indication that things have go, gone wrong when this bishop has to go back to such a passive square. Queen d5 and white takes control in the middle. It's a beautiful position. Hitting the rook, which moves. Exchange on b5. This is exactly the scenario that Giri was trying to avoid, where black's pieces are bunched around, protecting that lame pawn on d6, and white's pieces are perfectly placed. Now, we've got three pieces attacking the pawn on d6, three pieces defend. So that pawn can't be taken. But black is so tied down, that's the problem, and that gives white the opportunity to expand. So now the squeeze at start, and this is where you can start advancing your pawns. And later on in the game, this is really significant. This is a very important part of how you just ratchet up the pressure. If g6, then g4 and f5 can, can break things open. So king g8. F5, of course, just claim that space. And very risky to go back because it could be that white at some moment will be able to break open the king side. So in exchange, and that king kind of limps into the middle of the board. You see what I mean? Where it actually pays to put the king in the corner because it takes the king, uh, you know, longer to come back into the middle where it really should be. B4. Now this is really nice. So there's pressure on both sides of the board and it's gonna be possible for white to make a break on the queen side. So watch this. Rook d7. G4, there's no need to break yet. Just let him sweat. Everything's beautifully protected. Lovely space. King d8, the king would like to come over as quickly as possible. C4, and this, this is a decisive breakthrough. This decides the game, it really does. So for example, c takes b4, c takes b5. Okay, that's an easy variation. And we collect this one. So b takes c4, white exchanges on c5, 
an exchange on d7, and we have a pure good knight against bad bishop endgame. The basic plan is to advance this pawn, distract the king, take this one, and then head towards the kingside pawns. Now, it takes subtlety and finesse to execute that plan, but that's the basic idea. So let's see what happens. King b6, a4. Okay, so far so good. Okay, how does black wait here? It's very unpleasant when you're so passive. You know, do you move your pawns on the king's side? That's difficult because, you know, white is squeezing very nicely here. Do you move the king? Do you move the bishop? Okay, in the game, black played king c6. Okay, let's have a look at bishop f8. Well, in this case, white plays this, gains a bit more space. Let's say here, a5, and knight takes c5. Well, white is just going to win this one. The king and pawn endgame is obviously winning because white's king gets to f7. And otherwise, you know, how exactly does does black stop, you know, this knight bouncing around here to take the pawn on f7? The king is just too far away. If it tries to come back, that's very unfortunate. So that's typical of the, the tactics in this position. King c6. Now Abdus Satorov um, just sort of repeats the position. Um, there's no harm in that. You don't need to hurry this position when you have total control. The thing is to make sure in your own mind exactly how you're going to do it. Just so no harm in just shuffling a little bit. Now he goes for it. A5. So it's the basic plan. Distract the king. Of course, he had to calculate this exactly before he went in for it. And you know there are a few key variations. So for example, here, king b6. Uh, bishop b7 was played here. But if king b6, like this, attack that one. Knight b7, attack the bishop. Okay, now we can take here. Threat knight e6, if that's taken, a7, got to be taken, king takes, and we head for f8. So it's that kind of thing you have to get right. Bishop b7 played. Knight c3, bit of bouncing around. h4, gaining a little bit more space. This is actually very, very important. We're going to see why in a second. And the king comes in. Obviously, black is just completely passive here. Right, king d6. So the king is going the whole way and wants to come in and just hoover the pawns. So therefore, black has to try c4. You can actually go into e7, but king d5 is the simplest. Very nice bit of calculation. Right, let's let's see why this works. So, for example, if c3, that one has to be taken. Bishop takes. Now, watch this. This is the breakthrough. g5. If that's taken, then f6. And the h-pawn runs through. Or, if f6 to stop that, then you exchange and you break through to f6. So this is why these pawns were advanced right up the board. It's because you need to make a breakthrough. So bishop takes pawn played. Knight takes bishop. And once again, if king takes, king takes pawn, the pawn endgame is winning. Why is it winning? Well, if king b6, g5, that's taken. We've seen this break before. Pawn goes through, and if f6 to stop the breakthrough, then white's king is just gets there before black's king can come back and hoovers up the pawns. So that's why Abdus Satorov just had to calculate this exactly before he went in for plunged in for one of these long variations, basically. So after this. 
Giri push the pawn, but Abdusatorov had calculated that the knight can get back. Not via b5. Okay, how do you do it? All right, I'll have a little slurpity. You have a little think. White to play. Should have got you to calculate this before, actually, but anyway. Cheers. Knight c6. Check on c on a5, and then knight b3 stops the pawn. So now, basically, we've transposed into a king and pawn endgame. Uh, because the knight just controls the pawn and has unlimited tempi. G5, the breakthrough again. We've seen that before. F6 wins. So king e7. Exchange on h6, king e5. You can see it's just a king and pawn endgame, basically. And here, knight c1 is the winning move. So black is forced to move the king. Here, Giri resigned. So if king e7, then king c6, and you just force the king. Out of the way, you shoulder the king out of the way. The king steps back, you take the pawn, and game over. I thought that was a deeply impressive game by Abd Satorov. He's a very responsible player. If you look at his games so far in the tournament, he's shown excellent preparation. If you remember his game against Gukesh, he, so he's prepared to play complicated positions, but he's also prepared to sit and defend. We've seen him hold tough positions as well. And he is capable of playing beautiful positional squeezes like this. I mean, this game would be typical of, say, Magnus Carlsen, or going back further, Anatoly Karpov. Very typical of him. Very, very fine. And if we look at the, the live rating list, well, Abdus Satorov is up to 15th in the world. Um, you know, he is just as impressive as the Indian kids. Um, it's going to be fascinating to see how he gets on in the future as well. You know, there's Prague, there's Gukesh, Eragaisi, um, Abdus Satorov, Firuz Jar, you know, this younger generation. One of them will make it to the top. Maybe, maybe more than one. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Now, that win blows the tournament right open. So we have three players sharing the lead after seven rounds. Abdus Satorov, Gukesh and Giri on four and a half out of seven. So it really is wide open with six rounds to go. Thanks for watching.